Hello there, you're very welcome along to episode 25 of the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. The structures have not changed. The special congress result came in at the weekend and there was a majority, 50.4% or something, voted for change at the weekend, but it wasn't enough. Proposal B or Proposal A would have needed 60% for any change to come in ahead of Congress next year. But it does feel like we're on the precipice of change, Paddy Andrews. All the word coming out of uh, Special Congress this weekend did sound like there's going to be change. Actually, why, why am I asking you about Special Con- You didn't really care about Special Congress. You were just thinking about United <laughs> Liverpool. That's all you cared about this weekend. I don't care about United anymore as well after yesterday. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Bad weekend all around. Proposal so, B doesn't get through. And to be honest, didn't we... We kind of teed it up. It, it seemed like there was a couple of weeks where there was real momentum behind it, obviously, with the, the players coming out and, and certain coaches in certain counties. One of our guests tonight, obviously, uh, was a big supporter of it. And just the closer we got to it, it, uh, it was just starting to look a little bit more ropey. So I have to say, when, when the news came out on Twitter, I seen it on Saturday, that it didn't get through. I wasn't overly surprised, disappointed, of course. You were kind of hoping against hope that there would be some sort of change, but um, look, the ball is rolling. I suppose I seen Tom Parsons come out and speak on behalf of the GPA, and I know there's the, the main Congress is next February, so not too far along. It'll, it'll come around pretty pretty quickly. Um, there does seem to be an appetite. They, they won the popular vote. As well. Yeah, <laughs> what I read, it's Donald Trump esque. Well, well, we had but, our uh, we had Willow Callahan pulling out the the John King style map all week on OTBM, and like as you said, Paddy, there was a bit of momentum behind it, but I yeah. never really felt like it was going to get enough. There was just so much pushback from the provincial councils. And Andy, I think you kind of nailed it on the head last week when you were speaking about there needs to be a bit more room for. Uh, conversation here to figure out the other side and figure out what's going to happen. So maybe that's what happens next over the next six months. I have to admit, I'm a little bit sceptical that any yeah. significant change is going to happen because we are talking about structural change in the GEA for mm. so long. And our next guest, as Paddy mentioned, Colin Collins, really excited to have him on this week. He'll be talking to us about that in depth. But Andy, you know, Tom Parsons, uh, I have to admit, I've just got through his chapter there in the book. Um, yeah. Very, very enjoyable. <laughs> this is, nice little good good club. This is spectacular. I don't even pay for this, Tommy. I don't no, even pay for this. Yeah, no, 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 it's just, it's just call for about an hour. Have you? It's all teed up. <laughs> but I, I have a teleprompter through. here. I'm on with Ron Burgundy. <laughs> I, I just got through Barson's chapter in the book, and it, it just kind of struck me that he is showing a lot of leadership at the minute as the head of the GPA. And I think there was probably a period of time in the GPA when there were slights thrown, thrown towards them that they weren't doing enough for mm. players on the field of play. I know they always did an awful lot for players in terms of education and player welfare and working in the background, maybe the quieter things. But they have backed up their talk over the last couple of weeks and they've kind of backed up their players over the last three or four weeks and led the charge in this front in many ways. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be hugely critical of the GPA at times. Um but I think what they've achieved over the last couple of months is unbelievable. Like you, you try to come to a point of of changing the structures within a, an organisation that doesn't embrace change at all, really. And um, like you get the president, you get the top men all coming out saying this is a proposal based. And if the GPA had something to do with them negotiations behind, and they, they got McCarthy and these guys coming out saying this is a proposal B is the way to go. That's a huge stepping stone for the Gaelic Players Association because now all of a sudden they're using the power they have. Lads, because people keep saying, oh, the structures in Congress, the players hold the power here. Now, me and Paddy as players, we could never, it's hard to know what to do with that. Like, but yeah. if they really do want change, they hold the power here because without the, the players, you have no product. And with the, the, you've seen what was the major conversation over the last week or so. It all became financial. What could it bring mm-hmm. or what it couldn't bring and all. If they don't have a game, if they don't have the players willing to play, there's, there's a big issue. So the players hold the power. I think they've made huge strides over the last couple of weeks and months. Um, but now they have to go again. And yeah. uh, the, the, if they really want this, um, they, they have to push it through. But I think now even, Tommy, provincial championships, could, if they really want to do something, could change. So if you look at, and I'm not speaking on behalf of, Leitrim or anybody in Connacht at the, at the, with this statement, I'm just even thinking about it myself today in my own headline. If you have Connacht, for example, you have three teams there, they're in Division 4 in Sligo, Leitrim and, uh, and London. 
Okay, you have three teams who are hovering around Division One, Division Two in Roscommon, Galway, and uh, yeah. Roscommon, Galway, and, and Mayo. Mayo, right? So why not play a little round robin between Sligo, London, and Leitrim straight away? Give them two games against teams that they're of equal quality. Play that little round robin straight into a semi final against one of the other big three teams. All of a sudden, you have a better competition straight away. So even within this little vacuum we're going to have now for 12 months where the players are coming together, I do think there's little in, in, innovation Small that things. could happen. Yeah. Just, just little things. If people really want this so-called change that they're, that, that they're saying, it's awful easy to go up there and say, we want change and we need the structures to change. We, proposal B is on the table 18 months, two years now at this stage. Mm. You know? And to be honest, the debate was forced. Mm. It was forced. Like there weren't, like we did we did 12 hours we did 30 days of it on, on off the ball um like at the start it was a bit of a push to get people to come forward and talk about it you know um and it, it needed to be forced but like andy like the thing about the provincial things there i know from listening to the provincial secretaries that we had on the show they want that they do want the provincial round robins but i don't think that, that would be a huge step forward it might be a small step forward for the for the for the counties to get a bit more competitive, but I actually think that it'd be strengthening the power of the provincials over our championship structures. And I think I'm not going to guess what Colin Collins is going to say here, but from reading some of the stuff he said over the last couple of years, the the geographical provincial setup of our all Ireland being dictated by where your county is placed is what's holding it back. It's so imbalanced. There's different. There's nine counties in Ulster, thirteen in Leinster whatever, five in Connacht and, and six in Munster. It's so imbalanced, the way things, that, that it's all leading to the same place. So, um, look, we're going to get into... But, 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 but I don't think the Congress is the, is the way place. that you need someone to come in and say, this, mm-hmm. like, dude, I read a great book before um, from Michael Cox about it's Zonal American or the mix. Yes. Of whatever what on a book. Uh, yeah, and, like, oh, brilliant book. So he, he talks yeah. about the war that was in it when they changed the back pass route. So basically, the back used to be able to, 90, yeah. yeah, for the younger people, they used to like used to be able to kick the ball back to the keeper, and they used to be able to pick it up, and it slowed the game down. A lot of one nils and all this, and there was war. Howard Wilkinson, George Graham, all these guys, Des Walker, the famous centre half from England, all going mad about this because now all of a sudden they had to change the game, and and it became the greatest innovation that ever happened in in a, in, a, in the sport, and. But there was people giving out about it. This is what I'm saying. The next year after Paul McGrath wins Footballer of the Year because he was the only centre half in the Premiership that could actually play right. a ball. So yeah. it's like, you'd, sometimes you just need to grab the bloody thing and just go, we're actually was- changing the thing. We're not going to ask every person. Like, if I'm a footballer, lads, right? So I've got an agenda here. If I'm a footballer, I'm from Mayo, for example. My easiest route to get to Crow Park is through the route I'm going at the minute. Yeah. Why do I want to change it? Now, as Leitrim football manager, now all of a sudden I have a different agenda. I want them to have more competitive games in the middle of the summer right through. So I'm not the right person to ask. So somebody yeah. with a small subcommittee need to be with like the, as little agenda as you can have it, need to go and just make the decision. It doesn't, everyone doesn't have to have an opinion on this bloody thing. I know. But that's the one thing that's driven me crazy over the last six weeks is what about my structure or my structure or this structure or that structure? I think you're right. I think the democracy that we've been uh, playing around with in the GEA, it makes it very, very difficult for change. Even look at the vote that the CPA tried to bring through, that we get to see transparency, that we get to know that the delegate from your club that you've mandated to vote a certain way has gone and voted a certain way. That was laughed at the door. 86% said no to that. No accountability the, the, over who votes the, for what. The level of self-interest and bureaucracy is spectacular. Yeah. Off the chart that... And he's right in a way. Like you read some of the comments about why certain counties or delegates voted one way over another from some of their quotes over on social media over the weekend, and you're, what can you do? Yeah. Like you're, it's complete and utter nonsense. And, and we we've, we've sat on this pod and we're saying, look, you need to you need to go in there with an open mind. You need to listen to both sides of the argument. You need to listen to people. There has to be sacrifice from both sides, whatever way we go down, whatever road we decide to go down. But some of the stuff coming out, it's like prehistoric stuff. Like what? There's only so much rational thinking and rational decisions and and discussions you can have with people before they're just not willing to listen or or, or open or even engage with you. And that's the challenge in the GAA, the Congress structure, whatever about getting A, B, C, D, whatever it is getting through, the, the, the structure of 
voting change in is so, so, so dated. And Andy's right. It, sometimes you need to take the bull by the horns. And yeah. you look at VR That's- and soccer or goal line technology, all these type of things come in. It's not a everyone has a say. It's like you trust you entrust the governing body, you entrust the people in, at the top of the game to make the decisions and let them go and do it. Not having a, every single delegate from all over Ireland coming in with their own, exactly what Andy says, their own agenda. And it, that, that's that's so true. And I think that it, that was the problem. And it was one of the things that we learned over the weeks was the vested interests, the agendas. Oh. The, and I know that there was a slight thrown at the media Congress the weekend. I actually don't know what was fully said, but you know the media were accused of leading the debate in a, in a certain way as well. So I'm not so sure that it happened. Like we it's definitely the media's fac- job is to inform and well, engage. it was to facilitate a debate, I suppose, yeah. more so than Anthem. Um, the, uh, I'm I'm looking forward to bringing in Colin Collins here now, right? We're going to stick on Congress with Colin for a couple of minutes, but then I have to admit I'm I'm getting a little sick of talking about the structures right now. Uh, it's going to be a little while till we have him back on the table at, at Congress again. So let's do maybe 10, 15 minutes of Colin on what it was like being there yesterday. Uh, there was apparently an audible gasp of disappointment when it didn't get through. So I want to see if he actually thought there was really a chance. Andy, there was a couple of interesting bits that happened in the club championship in Mayo at the weekend. There was that class photo of Lee Keegan and Padre Gohora nailing each other and laughing and smiling. <laughs> um, Ryan O'Donoghue scored a big goal to knock Brafie out as well. So, like, there's there's been some big... Uh, ah, yeah, he scored a lovely goal, just a, a reverse, like, catch at the back post and he chips over. Chips over. Nice. I, I, he, he, was he going for a point or did he mean it? No, if it was anybody else, Paddy, I'd probably say the minute, but he definitely went for, like, an ex-soccer really? player. Yeah, I definitely went for it. Yeah, definitely. It was Henley and Nets. Yeah, yeah, in over oh, yeah, in thirteen. So it's a beautiful goal, beautiful goal. But it's um, yeah, it was good. It was a good week. I, I wide like, open. The, the reason I don't back lads, if I if I was a bet man at the weekend, I'd have lost the house. Like you know, <laughs> really. <laughs> I thought like Casabar played us last week. I thought yeah. they'd have too much for Gary Moore. Gary Moore wiped them. Um, again, Brafie, you'd have put you'd have put a lot yeah. on Brafie. They were very impressive, week impressive a few weeks ago. ago. Yeah. And like they were favourites to win the championship, Phil Mullet, stark outsiders, and Phil Mullet Cohen nipped them, and yeah, so it's a uh, it's good it's good championship, good championship in the in Mayo. You're yeah. you're definitely sick, aren't you? Oh, I I, <laughs> I, I couldn't wait till that game was over yesterday, so I could stop thinking about our game the week before at least. <laughs> at least play, once Casabar played another game, it was it, it was on, but it would it would, yeah. it's, it's so open, like it's so open. Yeah, there was a couple. Yeah, there was a couple of other headlines as well. We might come back to that when we let Colin go. I'm going to get him in now, and uh, we're going to take a quick ad break. Paddy, will you tell us afterwards? Is it a big deal that Vincent and Plunkett were relegated from the first division at the first senior yeah. the weekend? So, Seven years ago, that was the championship final. <sighs> Vincent's went on and won the All Ireland. Yeah, seven years ago, those two teams absolutely stacked the brilliant Plunkett's team, the Brogans and mm. Dale, Anthony Miles, and all these guys. Vinny's obviously. You know, they won a couple of All-Ireland club titles and seven years later, both those teams. I was surprised, but well beaten, to be fair as well. Um, and two massive, particularly Vincent's, you know, a huge club in Dublin. Um, Mossy is still kind of fighting the good fight for him, but they've had a huge turnover. Jerry Brennan, Dermot Connolly, these guys were the forefront of their All-Ireland winning teams. Yeah. And both relegated to the B Championship. And yeah, it's yeah. probably a big, it was a big weekend, some shocks in the Dublin Championship as well. Yeah, and uh, Keen Ward had perhaps one of the performances of the weekend. It was described as a mixture of uh, Stephen Gerrard and Frank Lampard, I think, as Wolf Tones uh, knocked out. It wasn't Frank Lampard. I don't know what the second person was, but Wolf Tones knocked out Ratote, who were going for three in a row to make it into the mid finals. That was a big upset, too. That's my mead mention out of the way. We're going to take a break here in the football pod of Paddy and Andy. It is episode 25. Please do hit subscribe. Share the podcast if you're enjoying it. We've had interviews with Hannah Tyrrell, Rory Gallagher, Connor McKenna over the last couple of weeks. And the longest serving current manager in intercounty football, Colm Collins, joins us next. All right, you're very welcome back to episode 25 of the football pod of Paddy and Andy. And I am delighted to welcome the current longest serving intercounty manager in the game, Colm Collins, to the show. Colm, we're going to get talking Clare football and your own background and coaching specifically. Uh, in the next couple of minutes but depressingly I want to start with Saturday and Special Congress and I'd like to ask you about a quote that was thrown out that there was an audible gasp of disappointment in the room when the vote was read out and uh, the proposal B had had got 50 point odd percent but not the 60% required was there disappointment in the room? 
I felt before the vote that we, we you know, before the vote was taken, we were in trouble. Um, as as it turned out, I think there's um, there's a couple of issues here. There were a couple of counties went into that vote saying they were voting for B and they didn't vote for B. Now, you know, fair fair enough. The teams are the counties. There's uh, nail color. Their colors the mass. That's fine. But to be uh, to, you know, to their, their their players, their management, their football boards, telling them to vote a certain way, and then they get into the room and they don't do it. So that's that has to end. Um, there's no point in having secret ballots if these people are holding, are abusing, are abusing the system. So that's the first thing. But I I, I felt that after the debate and after everybody spoke, I felt that it was it wasn't going to make it. No, even though so I know you spoke at Congress. Um, and we're going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. But nearly every uh, speaker that I, I've read since, they essentially spoke about wanting change on one side of their mouth and at the same time saying, but not this kind of change. Yeah. Is, that, is that, that not frustrating, Colin, as somebody uh, that, who's been listening I to I think that was an effort not to sound like a complete dinosaur. Um, you know, uh, this, this, <laughs> <laughs> this crack about love and change, but I, uh, only the change that I approve of. I, I mean, like there, there was a whole lot. Of, one of the one of the big words of Congress was flawed, flawed. The B proposal was flawed, and if there's anything that's more flawed than the existing system, I'd like to see it. But, but whatever. <laughs> but ah, uh, uh, it's ah, uh, it, it's it was very disappointing. I thought it was a great opportunity, but I I think that at this point that um, it's very important that they just don't park it. There's a lot of work has gone into this. And that they should tweak it and 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 see, I suppose, that little that thing about the six team in Division One being out of the championship. I think that they should go after that and sort that out. But make no mistake, it's no, it's 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 absolutely impossible to reform the championships if you are going to have to tie them into the provincials. That's like that's absolutely. I've I've been putting this through my head for a long, long time, long time before the, this debate started. Yeah. You have to you have to separate the provincials from the All Ireland series. No other way. No other and, way. Anything meaningful. We spent the first ten minutes of the podcast here, and Andy put it very well. Um, that the way we go about change and voting on it at Congress, and we mentioned the the CPA vote a couple of years ago, the motion that got rejected for transparency, it was rejected at eighty six percent. So, as you said, we don't know how people are voting, but also there's so many different vested interests and agendas. Andy said, as a, as a Mayo player, Andy, you jump in here and, and talk about this part. Like, I, no, Colin, I, ju- I just said, as a, as a Mayo player, my easiest route to, uh, uh, to Crow Park was basically the way it's going now. But, so I, I, if I was a Mayo player, I had an agenda then. And then now as Leitrim manager, I have an agenda now because I want more games for my, my team in the summer against teams that we can compete against. And away we go. So I have an agenda for B now where it could have been A as a player. So if you ask everyone, everywhere how we're going to come about change we're never going to reach where we need to reach to because congress doesn't allow for this to be pushed through in my opinion it literally doesn't because if if you want something done if you want something in work and business or anything like that you want something done you don't ask everyone in in your facility Mm -hmm. what do they want you you go implement change you bring it around and you bring people with you so i think the problem now with with getting anthem through is actually congress itself yeah uh, it, it, it's difficult, Andy, but I think at this point, like, to, to, to my mind, um, if we can get the three or four, co- three counties that, that voted against the wishes of their, um, of their football people, if we can get those on board, if we can uh, satisfy the, 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 the problems that where you would, uh, the six team in Division One, is out of the championship and the top team in Division 4 is in the championship and uh, I think we'll get there. Um, I don't think we should be held to ransom by vested interests. And th- th- this whole thing, I think there's a lot of things that need to be looked at here. Um, like you take the, the, the role of the provincial uh, secretaries here. These are full-time paid officials, right? That are supposed to be serving us, serving the GA. But these people weren't interested in anything that was going to improve the, the, the lot of the majority of the counties. And they were actively uh, 
um, canvassing and putting out scares, you know. Scares. Well, you're, you're, talking, you're talking about Brian McAvoy describing Proposal V as, as a Brexit-like proportion, using language like that. You're talking about him saying Turkey's voting for Christmas. Um, like Kieran Leddy, the Munster delegate, again, was one of these people that spoke about wanting change, but not this type of change. John Prenty was on the Football Review Committee, the task force to come up with these uh, proposals and was not advocating for these proposals to go through, from what I read. And then we had Michael Reynolds again on, on OTBAM and he, he was advocating more so for a provincial round robin to be implemented into, into Leinster. It's something that terrified me to know that if Mead got to a... There's another Mead mentioned that. If Mead got to a, a Leinster semi-final one year, they may be meeting Kildare the next year who would have played Longford, Louder and Offaly and be fully ready to go and again, another lopsided provincial round robin. That's what we were hearing, Colin, from, from the provincial secretaries. Colin, the, the atmosphere from Congress, was, it was hardly your first one, was it? Yeah, no, my second. I was at, I was at Congress as a 19-year-old student. Um, <laughs> my good friend, Tom Downs, who was Central Council Delegate, they were looking for um, a youth delegate to go to Congress. So I enjoyed the free hospitality of the International Hotel, the free meals and the free beer, and couldn't believe my luck. And it sounds like one of the, it sounds like a stag weekend, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great time. A great How do I get out of this? Like? How do we get out of this? Like? <laughs> and was the culture very much the same this time around? Oh, not at all. <laughs> this time was a bit different. Just up and up and up and down. That was it. There was no. The, the no, talk around no. the talk around Congress is that a lot of the decision making gets done in the Crow Park Hotel. I know maybe this year was a little different, but with, with we're coming off the back of the pandemic. And things aren't, the, you know, the way they would have been when you were 19 or, or any year before that. But there's the talk that a lot of the sway gets done on the day and a lot of the dealing and the, the wheeling and the dealing gets done in and around those 24 hours. I think of one thing's for sure, that has to change. I think transparency and accountability needs to become a part of this. I, I think the secret ballot, lads, has to go. Um, you, you know, they, they, if you're mandated by your county to vote in a certain way, you, you should vote that way. And, and it should be quite clear if you don't. And if, if there's somebody who has an issue, but it, his hand should be up. But uh, um, the, the secret ballot definitely has to go, especially on issues like this. It, it's, it's too important. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, definitely three, maybe four counties uh, went against the way they, they said they were going to vote. Do we know who those counties are? Well, you see, you, you're never 100% sure and there's a secret ballot. We're better off not saying it. I can give a shot. I can give a shot now. All right? No, you're better off not. I'm just going to have to edit I, that I'd, out. Then if you do. I'd say out. I'd say out of the high court if I can. Yeah. Yeah. No, let's yeah. do that. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that, that the thing, lads? It's like every you talk to anyone. Like, we all watched. Or I would say ninety percent of people who are interested in Gaelic football would have watched the Mayo Leitrim game on the Sunday game this year. Prime time slot. And it was not a good game. It was not a good advertisement for those players, for the supporters, for anyone involved. And we've touched on this the week after that game and since in this discussion. Every single person who cares about Gaelic football said this needs to change. Everyone. That includes the guys in, in Ulster and they have their own provincial championship. And I get the, the intricacies of that and the appeal of that. And it's... Without doubt, it's it's the most competitive provincial province. But every single person said we need to have change here. This is we can't keep going down this road. It's not going uphill; it's going downhill. This is getting worse. And there's an opportunity here, and, and we said it. Proposal B is not perfect. A is not perfect. B is not. If there was a perfect structure like Colin's talking about, it would be in place by now because there is an appetite for this to happen. But you need to make sacrifices along the way and to turn around and say, okay, B is not perfect and the sixth place team, that seemed to be a real stickler for a lot of people. Anyone who's voting against it, that this, that doesn't make sense how a team from Division 4 could be in and the team from the sixth well, Division 1 can't be. But there needs to be sacrifices here. It's, it's not perfect for either side. But to turn around and say, I want change, just not that change, so we'll just keep everything the same for another year is not the answer. Like, that's... How was that a way to run a championship or run an or the, the biggest organization in our country? Like, yeah, Eddie, 42 years ago, which um, we had we had the Milton massacre, right? And yeah. the news the newspapers on the Monday morning 
were littered with uh, this has to stop, these mismatches can't occur, blah, 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 42 mm. years ago. So for people, Colm, who, who may not know what the, the Milltown Massacre was, it was Kerry came to Milltown in 1979 to play Clare and they won by 921 to 19. And the Kerry team that day, I'm just looking at a photo here and they are fierce, strapping looking men back then. We all know the great, the great team at that time, but you had Paddy O'Shea, Tommy Doyle, Vincent O'Connor, Tim Kennelly, Paddy Lynch, John Egan, Jerry Power, Jack O'Shea, Owen Liston, Pat Spillane, Charlie Nelligan, Mickey Sheehy, <laughs> John O'Keefe, Mick Spillane, Jimmy Deanahan. I I've searched the over team. all over Column. I can't find any word on the Clare team that day or who was playing. Well, the main thing about the Clare thing that day, there was a brilliant young prospect playing with the minors on that day, and there was well, that was where all the talk was about. <laughs> all the focus was on that minor. <laughs> I was, but I I I never forget that team, Tommy. Um, I always thought that they they were probably the best outfit ever put together. Uh, they would play playing daily football. They were they were a fantastic group of of, of very talented um, footballers, athletes, everything. But they were surpassed by the dubs, and and it just shows you that at the time I thought we'd never ever see anything like them, and uh, but we did, and saw better. Yeah, uh, hey, we're, hey, we're gonna, we we spent a lot of time talking about the dubs in this podcast, Conor, and I want to come back to that because I want to I want to. They're, they're the capital city and the best football team that I've ever seen, so they should get that time. Yeah, no, they absolutely do. Fair play to Callum. <laughs> I've been listening to these two ages for the last 24 weeks. <laughs> I've been tell- I, I, all I've done is told you how good you are. But I, uh, um, no, I, I, the, that was a good one that fascinated me during the week, actually. This other oh, always be hammerings. But no one has tried to say that there's not going to be hammerings in this system. What we're trying to say is that we're giving teams the opportunity to play against an equal match team in prime time summer, it, like it, and like this, the notion took off. Oh, there will be all of the hammers. Even Rory, I think, said it last week. Rory Gallagher you know, said it last week. Yeah, yeah, he gave was, an example of the club championship. Yeah, and I was just kind of like, but that's not what we're saying. The point is, last year again for Leitrim against Mayo, that was the only game. The Sligo have had one game in two years, one game of football in two years, and a, a mauling against Mayo down in Park. That's what we're saying. It's not, there, of course, there's always going to be a mismatch. There could be a mismatch in that last 10 game, uh, last eight game with the proposal B system. But at least teams have got the opportunity okay. to play against equal match teams before they get to uh, even near that point. Like everything is relative. Obviously, only one team win the All Ireland. And in the Mayo context, Andy Wright, you know, the, 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 all the, 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 the rubbish in the media about Mayo and all that. But like Mayo have been inc- an incredible team. And mm-hmm. just because they came up second best to, to an excellent team on a few occasions, they're kind of, oh, yeah. But to my mind, uh, if, I was, if I was a Mayo man, I'd be proud as punch of this, uh, this group of players and, and, and mm-hmm. what they've achieved. And OK, only one county gets the Celtic cross. I know this. But there's, there, everything is relative. Everything is relative. And what success for me down on Clare wouldn't be considered success for Paddy in Dublin. But it, it, it's still progress. And, uh, you know, you've got, to, you've got to go after everything relative to where you are yourself. But uh, I, I just, I, I just think that the, 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 the mismatches, this rubbish that you're, these, these provincials that you're just because Mayo and, and Leitrim are beside each other, they should play each other every year. And uh, another point I'd make here is that um, I, I was for a kind of a different proposal initially, right? And um, where my proposal would get shut down is because you'd still have mismatches. Well, my point, Anna, was that if I go down to play Kerry, I have 113 years of his, history. Um, I, I'm, I'm fighting against that. My major problem is, is, is this, this is what has happened. And there have been numerous player teams that mightn't have been well prepared and so on and so forth that have got beaten by Kerry and so on. But, for example, if last year we were operating in a different system and we were out to play Tyrone, who we've never played before, there would be no fear whatsoever. We'd go out and have a crack. Now, Tyrone may, 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 probably would beat us, but we, it, there wouldn't be. But when we play this, the, this the, the, the myth is perpetuated every year when this thing keeps going on. And it just, the, the circle needs to be broken. That's, the, that, that's what needs to happen. Like, my initial pro, uh, was eight groups of four. We'd say you'd have the next year to five in one group, uh, play each other, 
top two go to the All Ireland series, bottom two go to the the B series. B series is played on Saturday evening before the All Ireland, um, the Talton Cup. They would have their own set of All Stars. They would tour with the A All Stars, and and get all of the benefits of the um the the, the winners of the A competition. Like there are some brilliant players out there that have never got near All Stars, and and that's not right because you know I know that for example if you take a John Heslin from Westmead. What would Mayo give to have him? You know, it's a decent, and John Heslin has never been mentioned for an All Star. Mm. You know, a, a super, super player. It's funny you mentioned well, John, yeah. Colm. I did a college documentary about nine years ago on player burnout in the GA, and John Heslin pulled a piece of paper out of his back pocket that had a Champions League format drawn up in it on how he wanted to play football. That was in 2013. And a quote he said on that. That documentary, I did it with uh, Eamon Dunhu in the Irish Times at the minute. John said, what is the point in any business, in any system, to train all year round for one or maybe two championship games in the summer? Training for nine months of the year for one or two. How can it make any sense? And it, it just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. If you started this structure from, th- from now, from today, with no history tradition, the current system would be the last, the last way you would set it up. But because we're tied, exactly what Colm's saying, years and years and years of tradition, history, I get all that, bits of it are positive, but, but you're tying yourself to something that is way out of date, completely outdated. And exactly what John is saying, what, what Colm was trying to do with his guys, trying to get promoted into Division 1, what Andy's going to be doing with his guys in Leitrim over the next few months going into the championship. Players won't commit to this anymore. There's too much going on in the real world that I'm not going to give up my whole 20s, a decade of my life where there's so much that you can do to train for eight months and then get wiped in the first round of the championship. Players will not do this anymore. They're going to walk away. They're already walking away. They are already, and I'm not talking about, we've touched on not just the weaker counties or whatever you want to call them. Players are walking away from every county. They don't want to do it. You've got to listen to them. The GPA did a survey over 80% of players, the guys on the ground who are actually, who are doing this, who are going to entertain the country next summer, have all said they want Proposal B and they haven't been listened to. What does that tell you? What are you thinking as a player going into to next season? It's now October. Andy's ringing the Leitrim lads through 1K time trials next week. What are those guys thinking? Do you know what I mean? The Leech is the problem. The that, is, Andy, that is the problem. Players, Andy, you said that players have the power. I don't think they do. If they had the power, this would have been enacted last week. Well, I, have- I think, not to misquote him, because I'm not going to misquote him, the clip of Michael Reynolds on OTBAM, and it is a two minute clip of a 35 minute discussion. But the response to the, to the question of the players and 80% of GPA player, the mandated players wanting change was. Those players aren't going to be there in two years. It's not about two response. years. It's about the future of GAA and Gaelic yeah, exactly. football. And like, just to quote yeah, Leitrim there, I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, Andy, but the Leitrim delegate at the Special Congress at the weekend said that walking off the pitch in Castle Bar, and we've spoken about being there and watching that game, the Leitrim, some of the Leitrim lads said, unless something changes, we're not, we're not doing that again. Like, We're not coming back. Um, and I think the year before the pandemic, 2019, 2020, we saw record numbers of players leaving. Gaelic football in their mid twenties, like, and it, it's it's going to keep happening. It's going to keep happening. Can I just tell you what the GA's response in nineteen eighty was, Colm, to Kerry's drubbing thirty six point win against Clare? The GA decided the way they'd fix it was that they'd give Kerry a bye to the Munster final. That's how they fix it. <laughs> and my my good friends in the north were up in arms at the time because they um they perceived and they, this is. So relatively recently, they they were um, roaring and bawling about the the fact that Kerry were getting uh, an easy run to the All Ireland semi final, and it wasn't fair. And they were um, killing each other above the north, and 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 coming into the semi final, uh, having had to peak for the first for for May, where Kerry didn't have to peak till August. But that seems to have all changed mysteriously. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, 
We had it for years with Dublin as well, like through, through the Leinster championship. You still, you still have it. Dublin don't get tested, and then all of a sudden we do get tested, and it's like, oh, Dublin have gone backwards. This type of thing. It's like a players, but when you're in it, you just you play and you get ready and you get on with it and stuff like that. But this the kind of narrative around exactly what Colm's saying. Some people, you're never gonna please everyone. You're never going to please everyone. And Andy's point at the start of this recording about trying to get something as, as huge, a huge change. Just, you're never going to get consensus on it. So why ask everyone? Trust trust the people. Trust, honestly, you wouldn't do it in business. You would no, not no, do that in, in business. No, no. no uh, that, that, that point is very well made. If you had to go and ask uh, 10 different people to what you were going to do in business, you'd get nothing done. So exactly. <laughs> Nothing done. No. But, uh, Co- Colin, will we leave Congress at that? Because I think... I, I'm going to miss Congress. Tell me <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Congress. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. We're in a Congress. I'm going on holidays next week to get away from it all. Yeah. Um, you mentioned 1979. I didn't actually know you were a minor in 1979. Yeah, uh, that's but, all. Uh, given, given, everything's given away with that now. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we might just talk Clare football for a little bit now. Because like we'd all know you as the Clare manager, but I'm not sure everyone would know that you're also the Cracklow manager at the same time. You combine both of them. And then again, I'm not sure everyone would know that you're originally a Kilmehill man. Back in 1980, you were obviously a young buck, but Kilmehill won their first senior title. Their only senior title in Clare football? Yeah. And you were you were, you were were one of the, the star boys that day? We thought we were going to win about seven in a row. And... Uh... 1980 won one, and that was the end of it. <laughs> one and done. But there was a very funny story. There was three brilliant footballers from Kilrush, um, the three Doherty's, and their mam used to go to every match, and she was a very witty woman. But we played them the following year after winning it, or two years after winning it, and there was a bit of boxing going on anyway. And the next thing, uh, she she, um, she famously said from the line, she said, go away, kill man, but you're one in a row. Kilrush had won five in a row. <laughs> 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 oh, and and why 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 leave Kamel? What happened? What like what was the journey like to bring you to Cracklow? Well, um, you know, I was based, and um, we 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 got we when we, we got married. We were living just behind the Gaelic grounds in Limerick. Okay, and uh, we um, I suppose that um, we always wanted to build a house, so um, we um, were lo- on the lookout, and um, a friend of mine here, Matt Crowley told me that this, um, that there was a man, Jackie, Jackie O'Gorman, actually hurdled with Claire, he's, he's a great Claire hurler. Uh, Jackie was selling the site, so we met Jackie and we did a deal, so we, we built here and uh, we've been here since and we've we've had a lovely time here. It's a great parish, lovely people and um, we've been very happy here. In terms of your coaching credentials, Colm, they, they go way back. Like you would have coached those Crato lads. You've obviously got Sean, Podge and and David uh, on the on the Crackle team at the minute, but you would have coached all those lads from a quite a young age. I remember reading a piece with Conor Ryan earlier in the summer, who obviously had to retire quite early from hurling and football about uh, an under twelve final when you were the coach, and the lads turned up and you had new gear bought for them and all of that. Like the, your coaching started way back at an earlier age, did it? I suppose I started with them lads under nine. Um, I I was you know I was a parent obviously of some of them and and um, I did football and Joe McGrath did the hurling and uh, I'd say we were with them since they were under nine uh, they were a great group of players um, Conor Ryan was probably the, the greatest loss of all time because he was such he was physically so strong and a brilliant footballer in hurling he was an awful loss to the club um, an awful loss because he was he he was the player we've been missing for for a few years but. You know, great, great lad, great lad. So from under nine all the way up to 2014, and we, we might just jump into that there because you take over the Clare job in 2013. I know you'd been involved in under 21 level before that. You were also the Cratlow manager. So in 2013, December 2013, Clare are off the back of winning the All-Ireland Hurling title. So the buzz is a, a light in the county at that time. And you're the Cratlow manager at that time. Cratlow go on in 2014 to win a football and a hurling double. I'm not sure. Can you put into context how big a deal that is for people listening at home? Well, it, it was a big deal at the time because it, it really had never been done before. Um, and, and, and Ennis did it, but uh, the two finals were played in two separate years, so it had never been done. Now, ironically, 
Uh, you have Erog again this year with, with quite a chance. They're in the football final and they're playing the Hurland semi-final next weekend. So, and, and they're a tremendous group of players, so it's not beyond them. In terms of the in terms of the, the culture in Clare football, like I, I find it to be a very interesting thing. I've got to learn a bit of it over the last couple of years. You're obviously originally a West Clare man, and Cratlow was right in the Limerick border. For people listening at home who may not get it, there's a big divide there between the hurling and the football in terms of geographical locations where where they're kind of placed. The majority of the football is played along the Atlantic, isn't it? It is the the West Coast right up along. Up the, so it would be unusual. Cratlow wouldn't have been. Uh, Traditionally, a strong foot. They played. They always played and competed, but they they wouldn't. But we just got lucky with a, a, a brilliant bunch of lads. that were all around, you know, which you get, which you get, you know. And uh, they said uh, they they've been they've been tremendous. Like they're 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 they're, they're they, you know they they give everything every day. They go out and um, uh, this year we didn't do so well in the football. We're very very disappointing. But. In the hurling, they 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 exited the quarterfinal stage, but played really well. It was a fine display. So, um, which is more can could be said for the football display, which was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, Colin, for, for you in your scenarios, as like I said, the longest serving manager at one county, you know, taking over Clare at a pretty low ebb in terms of football, uh, twenty fourteen Division Four. To we were speaking about on the pod earlier this year, one game away in Ennis against Mayo from getting to the top tier of, of Gaelic football and how what a journey that will be and the massive impact that could have for, for your players and, and for football and Clare to get that team exposed to playing Kerry, Dublin, Tyrone, all the Division 1 teams year in, year out. And we had a debate here about it. Like, what is, or I might put you on the spot here, in, in terms of for the progression of Clare football and and for you to feel like, geez, that is real success for us. Would a Munster football title for the first time since 92 be worth what? Or is it, do you know what? I'd love to get two or three years of Division One football, proper Division One, not like it was this year, it was kind of split. Like normal pre COVID, two or three seasons where these guys are getting exposed to the biggest teams, the biggest games, the biggest crowds. Because you look at what happened last year with, with Tip and Cavan. Brilliant days in their history, but ultimately it, it, they're, they're nearly set them back. They're both to Division Four next season. But what would you feel as ideal scenario? What what would you like to achieve with Clare? Yeah, often you're asked this question, which I remember when we were playing Mayo, and and uh, some somebody asked me which would you prioritize, the game in Killarney or the game against Mayo? And I I like. Obviously, it would be massive for us to win a Munster title. Yeah. And uh, it also would be great for us. But it, it's very important that, uh, you know, it's it's it, the, the whole, any progress you make, that it's it's built on firm foundations and that uh, that you don't get to a certain point and then think, oh, I've, we've made it, we're here now. Because <laughs> if you start taking that box, you'll, you'll be quickly kicked up. Behind. But it's very important that... Uh, that the progress, whatever progress that you make, is is underpinned with with good work and good young fellows coming through, and um, there's that everybody's on the same page, and there's um, you know that the, the standards are kept are kept very high. One thing that <coughs> I, irks me about the whole crack is that you know I think there's far too much made of the manager. Um, you know I think that if you don't, if you're not surrounded by really good people, mm. you, you could be. Be the greatest manager of all time, and you'll get nowhere. So that I, I've been very fortunate with the people that are around me. Um, I've I've had tremendous people with me, and they've done they've done re- a really good job. And they're they're the main reason that Clare football is 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 is, is competing and, and 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 doing relatively well. Staying in Division Two, like last two years, the 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 previous year to the Mayo one, we were we 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 had our man at home. Mm-hmm. To, to go, to go up as well and uh, you know we, we had it in our hands and, and made a couple of very basic errors and, and lost out that day as well but uh, I think that um, Andy you better surround yourself with really good guys mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah I, that's the key thing but it, like could I, you always have had I suppose coaches numerous coaches over the last five six years okay what like what's your major Kind of coaching, like not the philosophy stuff, or the way you like to do it. 
or when you're getting people in, what do you look, what do you like these really good people you're on about? What, you're, what do you look for them, guys? There's only two things I ever ask anybody that comes into Clare. Number one, that they're able to shut their mouths, that they're not blabbering about what's going on and that they, you know, that they have the ability to, to, to keep things in house. And the other thing is, um, you know, a, 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 pro, a, a mindset, an open mindset that they believe in growth and they believe that you can improve. Uh, and they're the only things that I ask anybody. And the other thing is, if you if you take somebody in and he's a brilliant s &C coach, don't interfere with him. You let him do his job. And then um, same thing with football coaching. Like uh, we've had, we've been very fortunate. And and one thing that happened to me by complete accident, Andy, is that um, I we started off with with Paddy Kassan and and Paddy of his own accord left after a year. He was a great coach. And then we got an, and the next the next coach came in and so on. And they you know so that I think that it worked in our favour. That, that we didn't have coaches for a long time. No, obviously they couldn't get on with the the, the, the Oak and Charity. But, but, <laughs> yeah, you saw the truth. Say that to Carl. It, it we weren't was... going we to stop you there. <laughs> but it worked. It was a complete accident, but it worked in our favour in the sense that lads were hearing a new voice every couple of years, and they really liked that. The players liked that, and um, that 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 worked in our favour. But it wasn't part of the master plan. No, it wasn't. Some of the some of the coaches that you've had about you mentioned Paddy Kassan and and Andy has spoken a good bit about the standard that Cork team set in 2010 for the Mayo uh, lads to follow in terms of having a base and a standard to to look at. Mick Bohan comes in as well, and you also had Alan Flynn involved, who was involved in a very talented Galway team too. And I, you've had plenty of other coaches top of the head though, but but Mick Bohan coming in, we we've seen what he's done in terms of the progression of the ladies game as well. Paddy would have been coached by him quite a bit. And he's yeah. somebody who would have put a massive emphasis on, on skills and, and skill That's execution. Skills, yeah. when, when you first took over in 2013, Paddy mentioned the base level that was there. It was Division 4. So for a bit of context, the, the old 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B system was kind of gotten rid of in 2008. Clare were sent from, I think, 2A down to Division 4. And they stayed there from 2008 up until 2013. Um, you come in in your first year. You've replaced Mick O'Dwyer. I think, was, am I right in saying that was, Mick's last ever management job, or he certainly he said it was the time. He may have come back again for another one or two, but no, he, I, think, uh, I think that was it. I think Claire Claire finished him. I think that yeah. that, that, <laughs> that was that that could have been his fight. I think it was. It was. <laughs> um, like and you coming in there and like the buzz about the hurling at that time, like 2013, kind of came out a little bit out of nowhere. It was a very young Claire team. You're taking over from a team in Division Four. I suppose what I'm asking you is. Was there a degree of pressure there or was it things are at such a low ebb and I know that Clare been knocking on the door that they kind of fallen short of three or four years in a row they finished maybe third in Division 4. Was there a pressure or was it this can't get any worse? Well, obviously, you know, the, there, there's no, there's, you, you can't go down any further anyway. That's, that's a fact. Uh, so <laughs> there was no... There was, it, there was The only way was up. Now... What people don't realise, uh, you know, looking at the bare stats, it looked as if Clare were, were pretty poor. But th on, on, I think it was the last three years before that, on the last day, they were in with a chance of promotion. Um, you know, and they were just simple stuff was happening, you know, little stuff uh, like one of Clare's, you know, greatest players um, in, 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 I think, the, the year before I came in, David Tuberty. David had a free and, you know, it was a difficult enough free for a right footer kicker to about 45 metres out, right hand side. And David went for it. And I was talking to him the following year and I said, that happens again. They did. They, they, now, what, 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 what the referee wouldn't have been aware of at the time was that if Claire drew the match, we were promoted. So that the significance of a draw wouldn't have been in the referee's head. And he'd be, you know, in his own, they're human. And they'd have let us have have um, that last play if he had gone short and, and gone for the kick. So as that happens again, you know, make sure that you play the percentages. You you go for it. But it was as close as that. I mean, there was there was there was lads in before me that you know you'd like me with Mikko, you'd Jerkeen and Michael uh, Neil and two great guys. Mihal McDermott did tremendous work. There was there was lots of stuff, but they, but they just it was it was close enough. So. 
I mean, we came in and I, I felt that the players were there. We really had some excellent players and uh, um, it st- we started to get a couple of results together and, and a few hiccups along the, along the way. And But uh, it, it, it has worked out well. It has worked out well. Just just the top line on the journey, Paddy, you jump in then. Like it's, it's 2014, your Division 4 runners-up. 2016, your Division 3 champions. You, you beat Kildare. I, I know in and around then, Kildare caught you in the championship in a game that, that you would have probably regretted back then as well 2016 you're all Ireland quarter finalists but you meet Kerry I say you you meet Kerry in the sense that you've played Kerry in seven of the eight championship years that you've been in charge 2019 you miss out in the Super 8s was it Mead that bet you in the qualifiers that year late on Mead Peterson in a cracking game in Portisha yeah the fine lines there in terms of Super 8s and then 2020 you're, you're beaten by Tipperary and I know there's probably some regrets over 2020 and, and how that went in terms of how that went for Tipperary. Like when you look at the, the journey of <laughs> the two teams, Tipperary probably, the two years have been examples of teams that have kind of grown in that decade um, from quite a low base before that. So that was just the way it went in 2020. So like that progression to go from five, six, seven years of division, I think Clare haven't played Division 1 football since 1996. So like you're talking a long time of Division 4 football to get to where you are. When you got in there first off, what what were the what were the basics that you just tried to get right? Well, I, I suppose you 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 set standards and and you 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 make players be responsible for those. That now, I I've been very fortunate with the with the players because um, you know, the, 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 it wasn't a hard sell for a lot of these guys. Like fellas like Gary Brennan and Gordon Kelly, like these fellas were complete professionals. There was nobody playing with Kerry or Dublin or anything anywhere else, Mayo, that were, were just, uh, he, these fellas were, you know, incredibly professional in the preparation. And what we were trying to do was to get, you know, a group of people like you, you you get a panel of players and you say there's 30 there and, and to, to, you know, not everybody's going to be in the same wavelength, but if you can get the majority of the panel all thinking like Gordon and Gary, like 20 out of the 30 thinking like a then it becomes an uncomfortable place for the other ten to be because mm-hmm. you're either you're either you're either in or you're out, and uh, and that's what happened. These 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 fellas set standards and and they adhered to them and they walked the walk and and that 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 was the key. That was the key for me anyway. And then like you're you're going along on that nice route. You're really consistent. You're getting to Division Three, Division Two, doing well in the championship. And then the phone rings and it's Gordon Kelly at the end of it. Or it's Gary Brennan, they're saying, right, Colin, I've enough here. How do, how does that sit then? You know, like they like from the outside looking in, I've marked Gordon, nightmare, absolute nightmare. Um, Gary, superb player. Joe, when, when them two guys hang it up, how, how like where do you go from there? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that setback? I have to thank I have to thank the hurling club and Ballier for preparing me for all this because <laughs> Ballier against all odds won the won the the, the Clare title was it in oh god what year 15 or what year did they win I'll, I'll uh, get it here I'll get it here yeah. but anyway so you know Gary and there was a there was a few more of the football Pierce Lillis and these were on the team so suddenly we were saying okay they've won the, now they're playing Munster and uh, next thing will they ever win Munster and they won Munster and they're in the All-Ireland Club so suddenly <laughs> We're having to go out and play without our our our, our, our big player like sixteen. But, but we we did a little chat about it and we said, okay, we can make a big deal out of this thing, or we can just get on with it. He could have just broken his leg or done his cool shit. So let's get on with it. And it it really prepared us for what happens subsequently when fellas pull out. We just said, okay, next man up, let's get on with it. No 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 crying and no ball. Let's 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 move. But that year was quite trying. I'll never forget the first night that he told me below in UL that he wasn't going to be he wasn't going to be available. I I, I just couldn't believe it. I nearly cried. But uh, <laughs> we, we 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 dealt with it at the time and 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 it prepared us then for the transition when it happened that these fellas left and so on and so forth. And uh, oh, don't get me wrong, they're they're not easy. They're not easy to replace. But I think a lot of it is is you know you just say here this is this this is life. Let's get on with it. Have you felt the the players coming through in Clare over the last couple of years? Has there been a difference there? Because they know 
I suppose the team that they're going into or maybe the, the aspirations that they can have that there's a, a rising tide there? Like, is that something that you can recognise in the moment? Are you seeing that at the minute? Is there a bit of a buzz around Clare football? Well, I, I've always found that players were really anxious to come in and, you know, anxious to play. And I mean, you know, it, it, it has happened that players have come in and, you know, their lifestyle mightn't suit. It wasn't the lifestyle of an intercounty footballer. And they, they discovered this and, and, you know, that was it. We just parted ways. But, um, you know, that's that, that, that nothing's going to change that. That happens in the best of counties where, you know, players... Like, there's no point in uh, in trying... It does, Colin. I'm telling how it does. Uh, thanks, Paddy. Thank you. <laughs> well, Paddy, Paddy, no, Paddy, Paddy told us all about that himself a couple of... 20, but, 2012, 2011. But, you know, there's... They, they, like... You know, when a person from uh, from a club rings me and he says to me, will you have a look at this fella, this this young fella that's playing with us, he's a good player. My first question back to him is, what's his lifestyle like? And I know full <laughs> well, if, <laughs> if this fella if this fella's interested in, in a certain lifestyle, he's wasting his time coming in, coming in playing inter-county football. He's absolutely wasting his time. Was that something that you were always aware of or is that the way that football has just gone? Well, what I found is that, um, you know, you take Gary and, and Gordon now for, ex- for two examples. This is, this is what they've chosen. This is the life they've chosen. They, they eat properly. And I'm quite sure that Gary, t- Gary and Gordon today, they're the same way. They, 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 eat, they eat properly. They prepare properly. Uh, and I think, you know, while, you know, and some, some, Com- commentators are going on bemoaning this crack, this drink culture and all these things that was was there in the past and this is gone. But th- th- this is a lifestyle that Gary and Gordon and, and a lot more chose chose and, and, and this is the way they were going they're going to live their lives. Whether they're I'm quite sure that nothing has changed in either of those cases like this. When they finish playing into county, they're still going to do do eat properly, they're gonna they're gonna train, they're gonna keep themselves in shape. And uh and it's 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 a lifestyle that people tend to choose. I think that as a as a as as a race, we we've been we, we've become very health conscious. Andy would have first hand knowledge of all this, mm. and that you know you'd see during COVID now, for example, you know I I I'd be driving around a lot, and the amount of people out exercising, and it it it, it you know our attitude to, to 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 things like that is has changed, and <coughs> I think there's um. The old days are being glorified by some of these commentators, and I, I, I don't agree. I think, you know, just take these people as, as, as husbands, as parents, as workers in, in the business they're in. You know, these are fellas you can depend on. Like, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to be. You know, there's nothing stupid going on there. These, these are, these are better people in my book. You know that they, that whole lifestyle is preparing them. Uh, for for a for a good life and a, and well nobody is a pain free life but a relatively pain free life anyway. I remember being down, uh, Colin. I, I I played the the last international rules underage um, tour in 2006, 15 years ago, and Gary Brennan was on it. Gary, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even then, we were what, what it was under 17, we're 16, 17 years of age, like, and even at that stage, he was such a mature guy you know we guys like Michael Murphy and Pierce Hanley who, who Andy had known well so, some really top guys on that tour and Gary was one of the leading guys on it you know and that's 15 years ago you know what I mean having that mentality and the self-awareness at, at 16 17 years of age you know it, it just says it all really about him and I'm no surprise to, to see and follow his career of what he's done, exactly what you're saying about guys like Sean Heslin and stuff. You probably don't get the credit you deserve because you're not, you know, in terms of nationwide recognition, in terms of playing in all Ireland semi finals and finals and Division One finals and things like that. But what an, out, an outstanding guy! And from literally 15 years ago, you, you could see this guy's a, a serious bit of stuff, you know. And it's, I suppose, it comes back to that. Those, like I say, we're talking about proposals and stuff, given players from across the board, limelight summertime games, all that type of thing. It's disappointing to see when you have players like Gary and, and lots of other examples of counties around Ireland where they've missed out on that to a point. And, and there's an opportunity now to try and give everyone an opportunity around that as opposed to 
the, what's going on at the minute, you know. David Tuberty is probably one example there, Colin. Oh, you know, a stat came out this year that he was, uh, and we're not very good at stats and, and keeping records on on scores and appearances and all of that. Uh, across what's your the job, Tommy? No, 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 that's yeah. not me and Andy's job. <laughs> yeah, thanks. But the record of Tuberty being the top most scorer in, in intercounty mm-hmm. football history in the leagues is, is just remarkable. Like, it's, it's something that you can take for granted that the quality is there across the board in the county's luck. Like. Uh, super, super guy. Super, another, another super guy. But, you know, it's very easy to run a, run, a, run a show when you have people like that setting the standards, you know. And uh, David would be naturally a very quiet lad, lovely, lovely, lovely lad. But when David would say something, it would carry serious weight, you know. So anytime he talked, people, people listened and... Uh, as I said, uh, he, he, you know, they were real leaders. Like, they were lads that, that uh, you know, they walked the walk. You could depend on them. You weren't worried about where they were on Saturday night, I can tell you that. <laughs> he was working. <laughs> that was, that's the thing. That leads me on to my next question. I, 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 I popped into Tommy Tuberty's um, a wee while ago for a, for a piece, and I learned that, I, I'd never known as the Dublin footballers, there's a real connection there between that Dublin six in a row team and, and Doom Beg and Clare. I don't know whether it's the golf paddy or it's Tuberty's pub, but Rump, Rump, Colin, they used to come down Rump's and play you. Part of <laughs> they used to come down and play you quite a bit during that time. They um, they they came every year for their kind of weekend away and and they showed all the Clare people that they were human. <laughs> 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 the, the the mystique again that the, 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 these these Dublin fellas had were was blown out the window. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying to, you're saying to us he, he exposed the wolf in West Clare, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> too, too many times. But, um, one of the places he used to call to was Tuberty's. Tuberty's they've a great business in Dunbeg. They have a lovely lovely pub and restaurant in, in Dunbeg and. Uh, they were regular. They were regular callers there when they when they came down. Yeah, there's a couple of photos, all right, in the wall. I can't remember if you were in them, Paddy, but you were definitely down there a couple of times, weren't you? you no, we were. Fifteen was our first year. Uh, Fifteen, and and obviously we um, Jim's uh, father and uh, Jim Senior is, is from down in West Clare, so. 15 was our first year down. We, we played you guys, Colin, in Milltown Malbay, and there was a big crowd there. I think it was a Thursday night or a Friday evening. We used to go down for, for a couple of days, and uh, and it was massive for us. Obviously, we were fortunate enough to go on, and we won the All-Ireland that year, and then kind of carried it on every year since. We, we went a couple of diff- different times during different seasons, but uh, it was a great getaway for, for, for the players uh, to, to get out of Dublin and the facilities down there, and then train in one of the local pitches, and and do a kind of coaching session with local kids and stuff like that as well. And Jim would have been very big on that. And exactly what Colm's saying in terms of creating that environment and that that kind of atmosphere and culture where, yeah, we, we got to enjoy ourselves. We definitely did. We got to play a bit of golf and a few points. Um, but we used to we used to have to earn them. That that was the that was the, the carrot we had to uh, train pretty hard in advance to to, to get out. The the, the original con- contact, of course, was Jim's dad. It was just yes. from just down the road and. Uh, so, you know, they, they used to come to, to Trump and Dunbeg, a uh, beautiful, beautiful hotel. Um, yeah, beautiful. Uh, you know, you, you will not get a better hotel in this country. It's, it's class, like, very well run. Uh, you know, they, they, it's everything there. And there's a lovely golf course on it and beautiful beach, um, you know. So they, 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 the doves came there. And once they started winning, then it's like everything. Uh, <laughs> back. They they kept coming back, so it was all good. Yeah, thinking, does it ever? Does the sun ever shine on the west coast of Ireland? No, no, oh, no. It no. does. Tell in between. And the he, uh, in, doing bag, no matter what time in, of year we went, I'm get playing. in there. The sun is on Castle Bar. <laughs> for for a man for a man that's worried about the sun, he's in Kerry Clare Mayo half his life. <laughs> <up there. laughs> he's buying a camp. Going retirement, as they say, Andrew. J- just in your in your coaching column, what was the first? What age were you when you took your first job? Uh, well, I, I, I've been, uh, we'll say, when, when I started as a kid, there was a fella called, um, I don't know, you probably don't have there, uh, Tom Downs, he was central, he was central council delegate for Clare for years and years and years, and Tom started us off, and, but Tom was an amazing guy, you know, he, he, um, he, he couldn't see anybody idle anyway, he had lots of qualities, and this was one of them, so, uh, I remember, um, I'd say I was just, um, I'd say 18, 18, and he said to me, do you notice 
that the, the at the time you know Sunday mass was was a big thing and people used to come in and they might go to the pub for a few beers after mass and there was all these young fellas around the village after after Sunday mass and he said come here just this we could do something with these crowd so anyway he had me he had me running an under nine league uh, I'd say I was only about eighteen I'd say at the time uh, so he started me off at that and I. Uh, I, I came. I, I did. I did. I trained to be a teacher in in Mary I, and I was so fortunate that I came across a great, great coach, Ogie Morn, the the the, the Kerry legend. And um, Ogie was, uh, you know, it was such a privilege to be coached by by someone like that. He was uh, not alone a great coach, but a great guy. So that that kind of between the two of them, between Tom and Ogie, I I had I had the bug then, and um, things kind of went a bit pear shaped with the club after we won the championship and uh, so I ended up actually training the team at 21 years of age you know that was that was uh, and I was living Her, in player living, manager. living at the Cork well I was, I was I had no I had no voice in selection I just trained the train because that's what I was called at the time like was the trainer so but um so that was that was the, the next so you were trip. traveling back from Cork to do that yeah, we we're driving up from Cork. It was, it was tough going on. There was many nights now, and I, I, I don't know how I didn't go in over the ditch going back. Like, you know, <laughs> yes. so you'd be sound, you'd be, you're, you'd be, you'd be half asleep. But uh, <laughs> so what you call? And then I got involved in them when I, when I, when I got involved in the development squads. Did the fourteens, fifteens, sixteens, minors, twenty ones. Had a very frustrating time with the 21s, especially, and I said, never again, now I'm finished with it. But um, uh, when they came then, um, we'd say after Kratlow's uh, success, um, they came and, and offered me the job. And as I said, I'm, I'm there since. So I have Tom Downs to, to, to thank for instilling a, a lifelong love for Gaelic football. But one mm -hmm. thing you were talking about the, the, the earlier on about Ethan, like I think that we as, as mentors and coaches have a great, like, okay, you know, let's not be fooled here. Everybody wants to win. But I also think that you, you've got a responsibility. The, 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 the game is way bigger than you and bigger than, so that you have a responsibility that to, to play a game that, players will enjoy playing and this it's not just about winning at all costs it's about these fellas uh, you know we've said it a thousand times they've got to play with a smile in their face they've got to be looking forward to coming to training otherwise you're not you're on a hiding to nothing you're you're going over Colin I, I had a question for you about maximizing resources and trying to get the very most out of what you what you can work with Claire football have a a draw at the minute, don't they? I, I've I've seen it around the fill us in on that. I know you're doing the salesman and you've been doing it every we've, week. But... We've 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 um we had a great success at club level with we raffled a car and we made a we made a lot of so we said listen we'll do it for Clare Football because every year we've had issues with development squads where they want some certain things and of course you know the board can only pay for so much because if one team gets it every team has to get it. So we we're, we're at the moment we're running a, a draw for a car uh, we're raffling um a, a, a Toyota RAV, beautiful car, and I'm going to be checking uh, tomorrow morning that Andy Morn, Paddy Andrews, and, and Tommy have all bought tickets for this. I'll buy a ticket. I'll buy it. Very <laughs> bad. I'm with a house in Killarney. <laughs> <laughs> See any more of those with a house in Killarney posters? I have the RAV outside the house here, and I can tell you this is one beautiful car to drive. So, anybody that, <laughs> what a any, salesman. Anybody that's listening here now, please go online and, and, and spend your 20 euros. You could do a lot worse for 20 euros. I'm going to put it up on screen because this will go up on YouTube as well. But where, the Claire GA website or is it just search for it's Claire? It's Claire, Fo Claire Football. There. It's on Instagram. It's okay. on Twitter and, and so on. And uh, you'll get the link there. So I'll, I'll, be looking out, I'll be looking out for the three. I'll, 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 after, <laughs> after we finish recording, I'll be on. <laughs> you, you've been very good at your time, Colin, so far. Just just a, a last question. Like It's very interesting seeing do you know a former Mayo uh, under 21, Owen Collins was down with you for a wee while. And then... You've Connor Jordan from Kerry with a Clare connection playing last year. It's the Austin Stacks man who would have played on underage as well with Kerry. When you're losing the likes of, of Gary Brennan or Gordon Kelly, like naturally players will retire or players will move on at certain stages. But you also have to deal with in Clare a very competitive dual system. There aren't a whole pile of counties that are as competitive at both codes as Clare are. 
you know, you can pick them Cork, Galway. There's there's only about seven, five, six, seven maybe that are. Is being Go in Cracknell Goblin? I, I wasn't gonna say, Colin. I'm glad you. That was a bit harsh yeah. on the hurlers who, there. Who, who have you lost? You know, in, in Dublin, like oh, well, the hurlers have lost. Obviously. The hurlers have lost an awful lot. Yeah, a hundred percent. This is the football pod now. Where we don't t- we don't talk hurling here at all. It's the football pod. <laughs> but uh, soccer occasionally and travel <laughs> as well. The, the, does the experience of, of being in Cracklow, I suppose, and knowing that you're working with the players uh, to to get them through on a hurling and a football um, schedule, we'll say, and it's it's that kind of unique nature of training two weeks for the football, two weeks for the hurling, and yourself and Joe McGrath had such success in 2014 winning the double. Did that help you over the last seven, eight years when you're trying to find that balance between getting the very best of what you can find in the county? Yeah, it obviously did. I mean, you'd be very aware of the issues that, that are involved here. And, you know, we'd say that it would prepare you then for other stuff that, you know, nobody lives, you know, players come to you training every evening and you don't know where they've been or what has happened them that day. So, you know, don't assume anything. Um, you know, like a great bit of advice I got a long time ago is um, if you're if you're in charge of a team, always put the players' interests first. Treat, the, you know, put the players' interests first. Never put your your own ego or never put your your your, your what you want to do with them. Put the players' interests first. And you won't make many mistakes. You won't make many mistakes if you put them first. And and they'll go to war for you then when you, when they know you do that. Yeah, you can tell that. So so just uh, like it, that's unreal. Uh, the Tom Downs Ogie Moore influence on you. Is there anyone from outside different sports that you'd kind of look to? Like, is there a Ferguson type figure that you you'd be reading up on or anything like that? Oh sure, kind. Of, like I haven't read a, I haven't read a book of fiction I'd say in twenty years. It's all. Mm-hmm. Bilicek, Ferguson, Joe Montana, all this kind of stuff. That's that's my entertainment, Andy. And you pick, listen to me. I, I, I've, I've often said this, that if you go into any club in Ireland tomorrow morning and you're watching the coach there, even if he's a bad one, you'll pick something up. You'll pick mm-hmm. something up all the time. You'll pick up something. I wouldn't do that. Or, you know, and I've been, you know, very fortunate with some, like, you know, do you take Mick Bowen? Like, he's a super coach and we were yeah. very fortunate to have him for a year and, you know, it's it's, it's uh, I learned a good, I learned a lot from Mick and 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 all the people that we've been we've been involved with every last one of them. You know, uh, we've we you just keep up. But as I said, oh, I I'd, I'd read those all day long, and you'll be yeah. I'll be stuck in those. So. Is, is there one in particular you'd throw at us a recommendation or a, a book or? <laughs> I I'd say this. You know, I know it's been touted a lot. The the, the legacy book by the all the the, the all, on the all backs. Um, that that that's a really good book for anybody involved in teams, and uh, mm. you know, you know, you can get get over the 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 the, the, the you know the, the thing. But I think there's a lot of little lessons there that would stand to 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 stand to you there. So eight seasons yeah. down, there's there's the chance that we're going to have a ninth season next year. I'm not. I'm putting you on the spot. I'm not. I don't know if I am. Uh, you know, as I said, I've. I've um, I'm talking with the the, 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 the board of assets back. Um, I think the lads want us. The players have been have been balloted. We we've asked them. So there's a, just a few things to be ironed out, uh, Tommy. And if if they get ironed out, hopefully we will be back. Colm, thanks so much for joining us on the football pod this week. I, I can tell that you're still learning. That's that's obviously what you're doing with your coaching. Uh, you're well, still trying to. That's so important. That's so important. Never. The day you think you know it all, I tell you, that's the day you're you're in for that that <laughs> kick on kicking the arse again. So, it's, been ple- it's been a pleasure having you on. I know we started off with special congress, but learning about your football journey as well has been yes. has been lovely to hear. So thanks so much. No, you're welcome, lads. Lovely to meet you. All, all, right, right, boy, for that. And all the best going forward. And we buy and those tickets. We are gonna buy our tickets now. Yeah. Okay, I'll be watching. I do <laughs> talk to you soon. Good, well, good night. Thank you God, appreciate easy. it. Bye bye. Okay, welcome back to episode 25 of the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. We are uh, just about to pull out our bank cards and buy our online tickets for the, the Clare Football yeah. Fundraiser. You're, you're treating us to them. What? I, yeah. thought, I thought you were going to offer him a book, Andy. As a <laughs> 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 going to raffle off a book What's with the you? car as well. Like. I'm, I'm serious pr- here. Third prize would be okay, wouldn't it? I've had a couple of people <laughs> on to me about the book this week. What's the story with it? Are they only stocking them in Mayo at the moment? Okay, this, this is... This is excellent. This is excellent, Tommy. Are you only... Uh, sold out on Mayo? Amazon. 
that, that book is on commission. <laughs> coming by Michelle Obama is number one, and number two is Andy Long. No, they, they, they're, they're only they only got came in last week, so okay. they're, they're they're being dis- distributed as we speak. So I just tell people to relax. You'll be able relax. to get your hands on them soon. I was actually yeah. 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 Maddie, I was talking to Maddie Ruan last week for a, a piece that's on off the ball at the minute, and uh, he himself was struggling to get a look at it. So, um, can't if, get it anywhere. If, so if, if a male footballer <laughs> is struggling to get it, so I've, I've got one of the only copies in the country at the minute. There, there you go. Is, there it is. Paddy, your uh, one's in the post, I'd say. So, no, we're going <laughs> go to collect it on Thursday. <laughs> Colin yeah. Collins, lads. A really, really interesting interview there. Like, what, like, Paddy or Andy, I love that question about you know what got him into coaching and and Tom Downs and Ogie Moran and and the kind of mm. being eighteen years old, I suppose, or even twenty one and and taking over the senior team. Like it clearly, he's it's somebody who has been informed by coaching his whole life and uh, and by football. And he's still learning, uh, as you can as you can hear from him there. So really interesting stuff from Colin Collins. Is there anything that you'd have taken from that interview in particular? Paddy Andrews going loose in the West Clare West Clare is that all? <laughs> no, I, I, I just remember, um, like I say, the first time we went down, uh, we we we, play, we only played Clare once. We used to mix it up. And we played Tipperary, we played Limerick in different years, but but just as absolutely sound guy, and you could see it, we could see it there, and and just listen to to, to the way he carries himself and his attitude towards towards coaching. And I would have spoke with with his son Podge occasionally as well. Um, it was obviously a brilliant hurler and had success on the hurling side of things as well. But it's just, look, it's just a brilliant story, you know. And you're, we touched on it with Antrim and Loudy examples this year. Andy, hopefully, going in and getting that bounce with Leitrim next year. You want to see these counties progressing, and and for him to do that for eight years, like say losing some key players just through the, the age, and <laughs> you know that there's not that huge conveyor belt of. If Dublin or Kerry or Mayo lose, have a turnover of players, which was a huge group of guys to come through. Clare don't really have that depth. Mm. He's still there and he's going back, like I say, touch wood for, for a ninth season. And I think it'll be a brilliant story. You know, he's good at when, when they didn't get over the Mayo game in, in Ennis earlier on in the league to get, to get a shot at Division One. It'll be an amazing story, you know, to see it happen. So delighted yeah. that, he, that he's going back and. Just a, just a breath of fresh air, really. What 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 a what a sound guy, you know. And you can see that just from our very pr- pretty brief conversation with him. Very. Uh, uh, what, what I would tell me, what I what I took from it is the the key thing. If you have a good S and C coach, get out of his way, let him do his job. You know, if you have a good field coach, get out of his way, let him do his job. Nutrition, all that. I think that's probably what he'd left. Like if you think about himself and Mick Mick Bowen together, like you've two strong characters there, <laughs> and. There has to be a bit of, I, I'm sure by talking to him there now, I, I, I imagine that he just, what, what are we doing, Mick? In we go, Mick goes in doing the coaching and he observes and he looks and he just trusts what he has there. And I, I, when we look through his list of coaches over the last couple of years, not afraid to change, very interested in what he says, having a new voice every year yeah. and it just worked out well for them. So yeah, there was a few little nuggets in that, you know? Yeah, no, really, really interesting. And, and thanks to Colin for, for joining us. We, can I go back to the because I'm a bit confused by the whole St. Vincent's All Ireland Champions 2016 being relegated at Senior B. What does Senior B mean? Are they intermediate or are they better no, than intermediate? No. Better than intermediate. So if you're relegated from the A Championship, you go into the B Championship. If you're relegated from B Championship, then you go down to intermediate. Okay. And so on, junior and so on and so forth. So the top two teams, the finalists of the Dublin Senior B Championship are promoted the following year to the A Championship. So okay. we're at the semi-final stage now. It's, it's Kula, which is Conor Callahan, Mick Fitzsimons, their club against Sylvester's in one semi-final. And my own club, St. Bridget's, they're managing more than capably without me. <laughs> um, they're playing Temple O, which is Niall Scully's club, and, and Owen O'Gara and those guys. So That's on the B all, side. That's all on the B side. So whoever yeah. wins th- both those semi-finals will be into the B final to, to try and win that championship. But more importantly, I suppose, from a club point of view, they've, they've promoted back to the, the top tier. So, And when did Bridges go down? Um, three, two two years ago. So last year was our first year. In. We got to the B final against Kula. Kula, Kula nicked us in that final. And for some reason, the Dublin County Board didn't have promotion in COVID year. I think one of the only counties not to do it. So we thought we were up, but uh, we weren't. So we had to do another year in oh. the B Championship. So, um, but now the, the semi-finals of the A and B Championship were all 
next weekend. So it's hurling this weekend in Dublin, then the, then the football semi-finals and the, the two eighth semi-finals be big. Bally Bally Bowden against Kilmacord, which is be two of the I think by numbers, they're probably the two biggest clubs in Ireland. I yeah. Think. Uh, so, so that'll be that'll be a big It'll game. Bigger Number picks than most counties, I'd say. I think it is. I think they are actually two, the two biggest clubs in the country. And the other semi-final, very novel, St. Jude's against Luke and Sarsfields. So uh, that just shows the change. It used to be Vinnie's, Plunkett's, our own club, Bridget's, Ballymone and things like that. So there's, there's a big change, like Andy said, about the Mayo Championship. There's yeah. Changing of the guard around clubs. Jude, Jude's are trying there for a while, Paddy, aren't they? Jude's have been in the mix. They made it to one final. They've always been quarter final, semi finals. Kevin McMenamin's club, Tom yeah. Leif, who, who, who's midfield. Gee, he was brilliant the last day. Yeah. Yeah, he got man of the match the last day. So look, it could be it could be one of those years where a traditional powerhouse, I suppose, like I think Kilmer could win it. But it could, it, this could be the year where, where someone someone steps up. But to be fair, look, like, they wouldn't have had Luca to beat Bally Moon. And it was, a, it was a massive win for them, last kick of the game. Um, and momentum, we, we touched on it, particularly in club stuff. The games are so thick and fast. You get a bit of momentum and the sky's the limit, really. You know, So it'll be very interesting now on Saturday and Sunday week how, how the semi-finals go. Yeah, no, no. The, the club action around the country is really heating up. There's some novel pairings in some championships. It, like it's, it's gone wide open in, in Mayo. I suppose Knockmore are still in the mix of Mayo, aren't they? Like. Be yeah, the Mayo Championship is funny. We we have about <clears throat> we have a good few teams are on the same level, and then you have the likes of Bill Mullet and Gary Moore coming in, and really, John you know, led by two young young fellas as well, Hessian for Gary Moore, hungry, aggressive, being abrasive, thinking got one two from wing wing back and went off at half time with an injury, um, and then you have Ryan O'Donoghue who kind of leading leading Bill mm-hmm. Mullet. Um, so it's it's funny when you get that young bit of. Brashness, high skill level into your team, you've got a huge chance. Not more. Westport are probably the two strongest teams. Yeah, you just, you, you just don't know. Not more. Nearly got pipped. Um, nearly got like a game that they were well in control of. Nearly got pipped in in um, in, in, in last day against uh, Ballantubber. Jeremy missed a penalty in the last minute, which should never have been a penalty. One of the really worst decisions I've ever seen in a football field, to be honest. And, really, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, and like, but the, yeah. The, could have put them out of the championship, you know, and um, but they, they got through, so it, it's not more Westport you'd imagine, but you just never know. You don't know what club, yeah. No, no, it's really interesting. Obviously, Cross McLean are back in the Armagh final again, burning Kilcour and down. Uh, Derek Canavan scored a key goal to bring Eric Kilcour into the throne last four, but there's some other counties as well where Conor McKenna uh, played the weekend, did he? I, McKenna has been playing club championship. I think it's club league he was talking about that he wasn't going to be playing right, Sundays. Okay. So he has been playing. I think, I, I don't know where they are, but they're... They, they, I, 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 I spotted a final. photo from some friends in Manchester that a couple of Toronto guys were over at the United-Liverpool game. Okay. So uh, <laughs> they must have played Saturday and flew over. Could so have been, yeah. Must have been, Liber- must have been Liverpool fans. If it's my oh, this is the United pub they were in, so it was a bad... I'm sure they had a good so, weekend despite the result. Sorry, one of the most interesting stories of the weekend was was the player led Nace team got into the Kildare uh, the Kildare final for the first time in thirty years of the weekend. So their uh, their manager had obviously left last week, and uh, Eamon Callahan, a uh, player you both probably would have came across. Thirty nine is he? 39? Is he 39? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that. so. Thirty nine, six points he scored. Still shooting the lights out. So there's still time for a comeback, Paddy Andrews. You still have a couple of years. No, no, no. You have six <laughs> years to play. Yes. <laughs> 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 we're just going to the A championship and come back I'm back I'm back I'm back I only play he only plays yeah. Yeah. I'm on a seven I'm on a seven all Ireland. he only yeah. plays eight <laughs> ego that's, mania. that's what I was thinking absolute so, ego mania Colin Collins think, would run me out the door <laughs> I think that's that's pretty much all the news last week the, the Hurland did try and overtake the football last week obviously Andy Moran's position as the most high profile appointment this winter was overshadowed by King Henry yes. King Henry taking the position in Galway that was so, an amazing uh, story though that's incredible. Like, even the fascination about, like, I would be very intrigued now about the Joe Canning situation. Um, Is so, he coming back, Andy Collins? But I, I don't know. Like, it, like it's just, <laughs> Joe, you get a phone call. Got to be thinking about it. Oh, you get a phone call from Henry Sheffield. Like you're, yes. you're thinking, you're thinking, know, maybe, you know. So it's it's um, hard to it's hard to guess what somebody would do. But from listening to Joe. Uh, when he retired and the week or so after it, the, the pressure seemed to weigh very heavily yeah. um, over the years. So I don't know whether you get a sense of when, once you step away from it um, and you start seeing the rest of life, 
is there much of an appeal to go back? But maybe he hasn't. Maybe it's been that quick that he, he might turn yeah, around. Yeah, We're not going to guess. Really, yeah. You know what? Even the fact that you're talking about it, look, if I know, did, did he play under Davy Fitz in college? He would play? have back in 07 in LIT. And that yeah. seemed to be, that seemed to be the way it, it was going to be Davy Fitz for the gig. Um, Davy obviously gets a bounce nearly everywhere he goes, but reading, reading from between the lines and, and kind of reports out of Galway, they probably weren't overly keen on that. And then the chef comes in out of downtown from nowhere. Oh, what man. a gig! That that yeah, like people are. If, if I was Joe Canning, and I'm not, but uh, you're definitely thinking about it. like what a an icon, one of the greatest ever hurlers has taken over. Brilliant record with with Bally Hale and. He's in the Thomas down now. We did a piece with. I, I was actually lucky enough to be in the background of it, producing it. But Brian O'Driscoll and Henry Sheffern playing golf in uh, Mount Juliet, and they have a really good chat There's about. You didn't get invited. No. This is <laughs> Next year. Trico has year. no all earnings. Not even one. <laughs> it's a good chat, though, about coaching. And Henry says that he left Ballyhill. Um, obviously, he, he went from playing into winning. And I think he won 18 out of 19 championship games. Maybe 18 out of 18. Probably was 18 out of 18. And they won two All-Irelands. Mm-hmm. And he needed a challenge. And Brian couldn't get his head around how he wouldn't manage in the Kilkenny Senior Championship. He went down to intermediate because he didn't want to manage against his own. But he's talking about club level. And uh, there's a really good kind of interaction there, a bit of a debate about what the likes of Ronan Nagara has done going off and expanding his knowledge around other counties. So I think there's a lot to be said for, for doing that. And I'd imagine Henry will learn whatever the go away lads learn from Henry Shefflin. I'm sure he'll be learning plenty. And you never well, know. We're going to play Kenny a lot between the league and obviously the Leinster Championship. Yeah. It's fast. Look, it's great. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Unbelievable. It's class. It is class. Okay. So that's a, a novel ending to the football pod this week with Paddy and Andy. We've ended it by talking about the hurling, but we'll give them that one. Um, huge thanks to Colm Collins this week for joining us on the football pod. Thank you all at home for listening. And to Paddy and Andy, thanks very much for joining me again. Thank you. 25 and done. Yeah, 25 and done. There we go. Yeah. We'll leave Good it at night, that, lads. Cheers. Good night, lads. <laughs>